No more need more home care for Nursing 106, Deborah Miller. As you can see, this is a picture of a normal newborn. The first 24 hours of life are the most dangerous. The first assessment that you'll do on a newborn is the APGAR scoring, and that's done at the bedside in one minute following delivery and then five minutes following delivery. So that is the first assessment that the baby will receive. And we'll talk about that later as we move through the slides. Immediate care of the newborn and assessment, you need to pay careful attention to cardio uh, respiratory function, thermoregulation, make sure the baby is properly identified uh, for security measures, assess the vital signs initially, and then assess for gestational age to, to identify maturity, any birth injuries that may have occurred, or any anomalies that the baby may have. So we know the first thing we do, we're assessing immediately on the perineum, we're suctioning the baby's mouth and the nose so we can um, assist the baby in not aspirating any fluid from the delivery and making sure the airway is good and clear. Immediately following delivery, uh, once a, a physician or clinician has placed the infant on the mo mother's abdomen, we immediately start drying the infant with warm blankets and just as quickly as one is damp, we replace that blanket and begin to continue to dry until the baby's completely dry and then we wrap the baby in a warm, dry blanket to help the baby maintain its temperature. Immediately following that, of course, then we're going to uh, identify the baby. So we're putting the bracelets on the baby, one on the wrist and one on the arm. It does have a bold black number that identifies the baby to the mother and the father. So there's two adult bracelets and two infant bracelets that we write the birth time, the baby's name, gender, and date, and apply those two to the baby, one to the mother, and then one to someone that she identifies as a significant other. We're going to immediately assess vital signs, that's temperature, pulse, and respiration in the room. Once we get the baby to the nursery, nursery for transition care, we'll obtain a blood pressure uh, two extremity blood pressure, it's usually an arm and a, and a thigh. Get those blood pressures. Make sure you look at your normal parameters for newborn vital signs. And then we're going to assess for gestational age or maturity. If you'll remember with the Dr. Ballard tape that Miss Spann shared with you in the Sim House, that's what we do. We do a Ballard scoring. And we have sheets that assist us in doing that, and we'll look at one of those as we move through the slides. And then, of course, we're looking for any birth injuries that may have occurred. If we had a vacuum extraction, we may be looking for a subglial hematoma. We, if we had a shoulder dystocia, we may be looking for a clavicle fracture. Anything that may have occurred due to a um, difficult delivery. And then, of course, we're looking for any anomalies hydrocephaly, uh, polydactyly, syndactyly, anything that would be abnormal, any uh, skin tags around the ears, just anything that doesn't look like it's within normal rim limits for that infant. Of course, we're going to suction the mouth and then the nose. Usually you'll notice the physicians are sucking, suctioning the mouth on the perineum when the baby's delivered. And then the nose, because we know the first thing that baby's going to do when those lung, when that chest is delivered, is cry to expand those lungs, and we want that mouth good and clear, so the baby does not aspirate any mucus that may be in the in the mouth. We're going to immediately dry. We're going to provide tactile stimulation to stimulate the baby to cry. We're going to perform an APGAR score at one minute and again at five minutes. If the baby's APGAR is less than seven at five minutes, then we're going to do another one in ten minutes until that baby has a seven or above APGAR score. We're going to place the baby on a preheated radiant warmer and use warm blankets. Make sure that the radiant warmer is preheated because we want to prevent conduction heat loss. 
uh, by the baby's skin coming in contact with a cold surface, which would be the radiant warmer. We want to make sure we prevent convection, heat loss by keeping the uh, baby away from drafts. And we want to make sure that we can prevent radiation heat loss caused by the baby being near a cold surface. Although it may not be in direct contact, we wouldn't want it up against a cold surface, a cold vent or something. Usually just simply drying the baby will stimulate crying, but if it doesn't, you can uh, gently rub the feet, gently rub down the spine to initiate crying. Then we want to make sure we properly identify the baby, get a set of vital signs and record the initial vital signs. Wrap the baby in a warm blanket, put a hat on, a stockinette cap on the baby, and take the baby back to the mother so we can promote bonding. And we promote by uh, positioning the baby where the baby's in that in face position. If the babies uh, are sensitive to light, we can dim the light, shave, shield the baby's eyes from the light so the baby can begin to open its eyes, and encourage mom and dad both to uh, coo and talk to the baby and encourage mom to unwrap the baby and, and observe the baby. You'll notice she's counting fingers and toes, encourage that. If she's going to breastfeed, we want to make sure that we encourage breastfeeding at this time. And of course, like I said, we're monitoring for any gross anomalies that may have occurred, may be present. And that's just mom in an infant's position with an older infant. This, of course, is not a newborn. But it shows how moms bay, uh, bond. And you can also see the reciprocity. This infant's old enough to, to look, gaze back, and coo. So they're on to the, uh, the event of reciprocity where mom's actually getting some satisfaction back from the baby. And that's a, a really good attachment exercise that you'll see parents do to where they become attached to one another. Of course, I spoke to, about the APGAR. The APGAR's the purpose is the first physical assessment the baby will have immediately following delivery. It's performed and recorded at one and five minutes. If the score is less than seven, you must repeat at ten minutes, and you repeat every ten minutes until you get a score of seven or above. Babies that um, we do assess for heart rate, respiratory effort, muscle tone, reflex response to suction or gentle slap on the soles of the feet, and skin color. So we're looking for a heart rate that's within normal range. It should be 100 or above. A respiratory effort, that's any effort that the baby makes to, uh, to, to cause respirations. If the baby's crying, of course, we know that's a good respiratory effort. If it's a good, lusty cry, then that baby would, would get a 2 on respiratory effort. If it's a wimpy cry and it's crying sporadically, not crying very often, but it is making an attempt to cry, then that would be a 1 on the APGAR score. If there are no attempts at crying or respirations, then that would be a 0. And then, of course, interventions would be put in place to help this baby's respiratory effort. We're checking for muscle tone. Uh, we should see some movement in all four extremities. Uh, there should be, uh, we, if you gently move the arms down by the side, they should recoil back up. You should see the baby moving its arms and legs uh, for good muscle tone. If they're very lethargic and flaccid and they're not moving their muscles at all, they're just limp as a dish rag, that would be a zero on muscle tone. Any movement at all, although it may not be a strong symmetrical effort, would be a 1 on the APGAR score. Reflex response to suction or gentle slap on the soles of the feet would be crying. That would be a reflex response to being slapped on your feet or gently stroked down your back. And then skin color. We're looking at a good pink, uh, good pink skin color. We want, don't want a dusky white color. Uh, we don't want the central cyanosis. Acrocyanosis, the blowing of the feet and hands, is a normal finding, although a child that's pink everywhere but the feet and hands would still get a 1 on the APGAR for skin color. If they had no signs of acrocyanosis, then they would get a 2 for skin color. That would mean they were pink everywhere. And then, of course, they had more dusty or, or white in color, no pink 
tone to their skin at all, that would be a zero on skin color. When you're looking at that APGAR score, infants that score 7 to 10 rarely need resuscitation. Babies that require that score 3 to 6 do many times require resuscitation. Sometimes it's just simply suctioning the, the mouth, maybe the uh, larynx, dry quickly, maintain their warmth. But you may have to provide some positive pressure ventilation until the heart rate is above 100, the color is pink, and spontaneous respirations begin. You may simply need to provide some blow-by oxygen after this attempt where you just simply hold the O2 tubing with 100% O2 flowing into the baby's nares. And then babies that score 0 to 2 require intensive resuscitation. You need to clear the airway, insert an endotracheal tube, use positive pressure ventilation with 100% oxygen at 40 to 60 breaths per minute, and initiate CPR if the heart rate is below 60. At all times, you need to be maintaining body temperature and supporting parents through this. Uh, you'll see that nurses that are NRP certified do the, the uh, advanced resuscitation of newborns that I just spoke to. Uh, and there's always two NRP certified nurses at every delivery. So we can ensure that the best that can be done for that baby will be done should there be an event that called for resuscitation measures. And this is just a diagram of the APGAR chart and where someone has actually uh, scored the baby. And it just uh, gives you an idea of what it looks like when you're doing an APGAR on the delivery record. Admission care, just the general guidelines. Of course, we always want to maintain thermoregulation, so we're going to keep the baby uh, warm near, during the newborn examination. So if we're doing the Ballard, we're doing the Ballard on the radiant warmer. Uh, we just begin with general observations, looking at symmetry of the head, the symmetry of the chest, the limbs, the placement of the eyes, the placement of the ears, whether the tongue is protruding, uh, the umbilical cord stump we're looking at for two arteries and a vein, is there plenty of Wharton's jelly. We're doing a general observation of the skin, looking for Mongolian spots, milia, lanugo, vernix. Lanugo, you know, is the fine downy hair. Uh, vernix is the cheesy cottage cheese cold cream, I call it, that babies are born with. Uh, some babies are born with that will have to be uh, washed off when they get their first bath. And then we uh, will observe the spine for any dimpling, tufts of hair around the sacrum. And then we'll just move on to more of a uh, in-depth assessment. If we do assi assess any abnormal findings, of course, we want to begin interventions as quickly as possible. And then, of course, we're going to document all of our normal and abnormal findings and any interventions that we may need to have put in place. Within the first hour of delivery, babies do need to have received their first medication. And if you'll remember from clinical, that's vitamin K, which is given in the vastus lateralis. It's an IM injection and erythromycin ointment, which is applied from the inner to the outer canthus of the eye. And it is uh, to protect against any bacteria that may have been picked up during delivery. It protects most effectively against gonorrhea and chlamydia. And then the vitamin K, of course, is to promote um, clotting factor. And that's just a picture of a nurse giving a vitamin K shot. Some of you have gotten to do that. And you can see on that baby's hip, he does have a Mongolian spot that she would have assessed for and uh, documented in his chart. And then the next slide you're going to see is just a baby receiving eye prophylaxis, the erythromycin ointment from inner to outer canthus. Those are metal tip tubes that she's using and that we use and many facilities do use. Uh, you need to be aware when you're applying. You want a good ribbon of that erythromycin ointment in there, but you want to be very careful not to cut, touch the baby's eye or cornea with that metal tip because it could scratch it and cause severe damage. For the sake of this lecture, you do need to know what the normal vital signs are. 
I'm not going to go over those with you. You can look in your book and know what they are. You should know from being prepared to go to clinical, so that would simply just be a review anyway. But know what the normal heart rate, resp respiratory rate, axillary temp, and blood pressure are for a newborn, and if they don't fall within those normal limits, what would be nursing interventions that you would need to do to ensure that those baby, those, that baby could recover? For instance, if you had a low axillary temp, something below 97.6, you would want to possibly retake that temp in the other axilla, or you may have already gotten a second temp, it's still below 97.6, so you want to double blanket the baby, put a cap and booties on, and retake in 30 minutes. If the temperature's still down, you would need to uh, preheat a radiant warmer and put that baby back on the radiant warmer. So no nursing interventions for any abnormal bottle signs on a newborn. And that's just obtaining a blood pressure on what we call a large for gestational age newborn. Body measurements, of course, you're going to want to, to acquire. The normal length for a newborn is anywhere from 18 to 22 inches, and this is a term newborn. Weight is anywhere from 5.5 to 9.4 four. 0.5 pounds. Anything that is above 400 grams or 8 pounds, 13 ounces, we would consider LGA baby or macrosomic baby, which was large for gestational age. And any baby below 25,000 gram, 2,500 grams, would be considered a low birth weight baby. The head circumference normally is 13 to 14 inches. The chest circumference is 12 to 13 and should be equal to or 2 to 3 centimeters less than the head circumference. And the abdominal circumference is approximately the same as the chest circumference is. Uh, once the baby's fed, though, you'll see that abdominal circumference may increase after feeding. So be aware when you're doing these measurements what could be things that would cause some variations from normal. It may be perfectly normal that they're abnormal at the time that you're doing it. And that's just uh, clinicians measuring the baby from head to, to foot, and you'll see some measure from crown to rump and then rump to heel. I find it easier just to uh, uh, mark a slash where the baby's head is, mark a, mark a slash where the baby's heel are when the baby is straight, and measure between the two marks, and that gives you a pretty accurate uh, idea of what the baby's length is. Measuring the head circumference, of course, you want to measure at the largest uh, diameter of the head. Do be aware that molding does occur in many infants, so there may be variations in the head side from uh, time to time when you measure. If you measure uh, one day and it's a little bit smaller than it would be the within the next 24 hours, it may be that there was quite a bit of melding that had occurred during delivery. So you just need to refer back to your nurse's notes where someone had did that a, a initial assessment and see if there was a lot of molding that had occurred. And then of course you would want to measure later to see if any uh, further growth had occurred because if it is continuing to increase in diameter, it could be indicative of hydrocephaly or something going on with the baby. Of course, when you measure in the chest curve circumference, you want to measure right at the nipple line. And then we're going to do a head to toe assessment. Know what expected normal findings are. The variations of normal would be, for instance, if you're um, assessing skin, would be it's, it's a variation from normal, but it is a normal finding to find Mongolian spots or milia. Um, do know what the abnorm abnormalities and warning signs might be on some of these physical assessment criteria. When you're assessing the skin, it is a pretty good indication or visible record of the newborn's health status. You can inspect the skin uh, related to full-term, preterm, and post-term infants. 
You can also inspect the skin for uh, changes in coloration or variations in color. Meconium staining, for instance, would be, give the skin a greenish brown discoloration. The nails in the cord would be discolored if uh, meconium was passed before birth. And if they're stained and it's difficult to, to, to wash off the stain, this could mean that it occurred well before delivery had occurred. Peeling and excessive cracking can be associated with post-term infants or maternal temperature. Uh, other findings would be melia, vernix cassiosa, lanugo, which is the fine, fine uh, downy hair, petechia would be indicative of bruising or maybe a bleeding abnormality. Jaundice, jaundice at birth would be uh, abnormal finding, you know, you usually do not see physiologic or normal jaundice until 24 hours after delivery. So if you see jaundice immediately at delivery, then this could be indicative of uh, liver problems. Birthmarks we know are normal, but they need to be documented. Erythema toxicum is not abnormal, but it still needs to be uh, documented. Mongolian spots, stork bites, and port wine stains would also be, also be something that you would document. When you're documenting them, you need to document what they are, the size, and the location. So uh, people doing further evaluation would note any changes in those findings. And this is a, just a depiction of the Ballard score, and you can look at the different areas that are actually assessed for gestational age. And it gives you a pretty good indication of how to perform each uh, check. So the neuromuscular maturity check is a yellow box and it's just telling you how you would perform that. And then you would score wherever your baby fell within that row, you would score uh, accordingly. And then the physical maturity is just skin, uh, Lenugo, plantar surfaces, very self-explanatory. It's telling you uh, what you're looking for and then giving you a score when you actually find, say on skin, I saw cracking, pale areas, rare veins. While looking at the baby on gross assessment, then I would give that baby a three for that score. And then I would add them up and look in my maturity rating here. Wherever the, that score fell on this maturity scale would be what my baby's gestational age would be according to Ballard's, Ballard scoring. And this is just a picture of the sole creases of an infant, and that is a term infant. It's covering two-thirds of the sole of the foot, so we know they would get a good score on that for sole creases or plantar surfaces. That would be a three for that baby on sole creases on the Ballard scoring. Male genitals, of course you're looking for rugae, are both testes descended? Um, and I'm guessing they are, I can't feel them. I would actually palpate the scrotum to see if I could detect both testes. Uh, but I'm, let's say that they are descended and I have good rugae and actually the testes are pendulous. So I would give that baby a four on that, on that scale. Acrocyanosis, this is just a picture of acrocyanosis. And if you look at the baby's trunk and face, the baby's good and pink, but the hands are a little blue. Uh, the feet are a little blue. If you can see that left foot, it is uh, the sole of the foot's blue. So that would be acrocyanosis. So on an APGAR score, that would, baby would receive a one because I'd have to take off one for the acrocyanosis. And this is just uh, erythema toxicum. It's just a normal newborn rash that uh, you will see. Just to give you an idea of what it looks like. Doesn't uh, usually subsides within about a week and uh, doesn't need any treatment. It's just a newborn rash. Lanugo, if you can see on this baby, the little downy, fine downy hairs on the baby's back. And it's probably covered all over, which is normal for, for newborns. Uh, you'll see a lot of newborn, or a lot of preterm infants born with l Lanugo, and it falls out shortly after delivery. Melia is just like a little newborn acne. Sometimes they will treat it with mycinex if it's, it doesn't really affect the baby, but some moms just really fret 
over those uh, little pimply things on their baby, so they will treat it sometimes to just put mama's mind at ease. And then stork bites do disappear also, the little red area at the nape of the neck on this infant um, are normal, but they do go away in time. The Mongolian spots do not fade. They're there, and you'll see them in many dark uh, ethnicities, dark skin ethnicities, uh, American Indian, India, uh, Middle Eastern Indian, African American babies, Mexican, Hispanic babies tend to have uh, more Mongolian spots than Caucasian babies. And then port wine stains on this infant, our little girl, you can see is there and it's quite pronounced and those are difficult. They do not go away spontaneously. They can be removed but they do not just spontaneously subside like the stork bites or uh, the milia. When we're looking at the newborn head, we're looking at the shape of the infant's head. It will vary depending on the type and length of labor. If uh, she was a vaginal delivery and it was a long process and the baby sat in the birth canal for a while, then the baby may have quite a bit of molding. We'll get that banana shaped head <coughs> or that cone head shape like on some Night like Live when I was a kid. Um, if it's a C-section and she hasn't labored any and she's a scheduled C-section, then she, the baby may have a perfectly round head uh, and be very pretty in shape. Um, when you're, when you're looking at it, you'll describe uh, the extent of molding, the shape of the head, whether the fontanelles are overlapping or uh, wide or overriding, they'll call it, uh, for movement through the vaginal canal. We know the bones of the skull and a newborn are not fused, so this makes them quite uh, malleable and they can mold to fit through the uh, birth canal. Cap it may uh, appear if baby has set low in the pelvis, been engaged for a while, and uh, some edema has uh, occurred at the uh, presenting part. We call that cap it, and it will be absorbed and requires no treatment. Cephalohematoma is caused by a co collection of blood between the periosteum and the bone of the skull. It may be unilateral or bilateral, but it does not cross suture lines and it'll di disappear in about three weeks. And that many times capus succedaneum uh, will progress into cephalohematoma if it has uh, been in the birth canal for a while, but we know that that will resolve with, within about a three weeks. Another baby has two soft spots, the anterior fontanelle and the posterior fontanelle. The anterior fontanelle usually closes around 18 months of age and the posterior fontanelle usually closes around 12 months of age. The anterior fontanelle is the largest and it's called the bregma. It's the diamond shape. And the po posterior fontanelle is the triangular shape. When you're assessing fontanelles, you want to assess whether they're, they're flat, sunken, or bulging. Uh, those could be indicative of several things going on. Of course, we want them flat. But if they're sunken, that could be an indication of dehydration. And if they're bulging, that could be an indication of uh, intracranial pressure, maybe from hydrocephaly or something else going on, uh, misshunting of the uh, cerebral spinal fluid. So those are things that you would need to assess for each time you assess the infant and document. If you do find that your fontanelles feel differently on one assessment than the other, it might be a good idea to go ahead and get another head circumference and compare it to the, uh, the last head circumference that was obtained to see if any uh, growing of the head circumference has occurred. And this is just a depiction of the newborn skull and you can see the anterior or bregma uh, fontanelle and then the post posterior fontanelle. And the nurse is assessing the anterior fontanelle. And this is just a picture of a cephalohematoma you know, caused by caput, probably. The baby's sitting in the birth canal for a while. 
and you can see how that swelling of that hematoma has occurred. It's not uh, life-threatening to the baby, will not cause any cognitive problems with the baby as it grows. It is just uh, a form of birth trauma and it will resolve within three weeks. And then there's cap caput and uh, the same goes there. It's just edema that has occurred in the soft tissue while the baby was sitting in the birth canal possibly for a prolonged period of time uh, until delivery and it will subside within about three weeks. When you're assessing the baby's eyes, you want to make sure you're looking for placement, color, and uh, vision. Are the, do they have low set eyes? Where are they located in relationship to the, to the ears? Um, what color are they? Is there any drainage? Is it purulent? Is it in one eye or is it bilateral? All that needs to be documented. Do you need to get a culture of the drainage from the baby's eyes? Maybe the baby picked up something in the birth canal that the erythromycin ointment didn't take care of. You would need to get a culture for that. We also want to assess the baby's ears. We're looking for placement. We know that a malposition of, of ears can be indicative of chromosomal abnormalities such as Down syndrome. We want to look at the penna. It should be above or on the line drawn from the canthus of the eye. The, the cartilage should be present and well formed. In full term infants, the cartilage is firm and you have an instant recoil when you bend the ear down. It usually will pop right back up or instant recoil is uh, noted. And infants usually are hearing, or their hearing is present usually after they have the first sneeze because that mucus is removed from the middle ear and the, the eustachian tube is cleared. The infant should turn or respond to the human voice or ringing of the bell uh, by becoming alert, moving the body. If it doesn't, then uh, further testing should be done. We know that all infants now in the state of Alabama undergo the bare hearing screen. So all infants are tested for hearing before they are discharged from the hospital. And then if anything abnormal is found, they're uh, immediately scheduled for a follow-up appointment. Uh, there are two things that could, there is, uh, we know maternal rubella uh, can affect fetal hearing or newborn hearing and any kind of congenital defects of the ear could cause that. When you're doing an external assessment of the ear, you may see ear tags. Sometimes that means nothing. Other times it can be indicative of other abnormalities that are going on. One that I can think of uh, is kid. This, it can be indicative of kidney ab abnormalities because the ear and the kidneys are formed around the same time uh, gestation. So you may see a skin tag around the ear or you may see some a little pitting around the ear. Uh, and that might be further evaluated to eliminate the possibility of, or rule out the possibility of any um, kidney anomalies going on. Then of course we want to make sure we assess the nose and we're looking at the shape of the nose. Is it patent? Is the baby sneezing? Most importantly, you know, do we see any nasal flaring? We know the infant's nose is relatively flat. Uh, immediately following delivery because of the tight squeeze during uh, labor and birth. Um, and infants breathe through the nose and not the mouth. So we want to make sure that we have cleared any mucus from the nose, although we're clearing it from the mouth first because our first initial breath is through the mouth and then it'll be through the nose. We're looking for any mucus or an atresia that may have occurred that make it difficult for the baby to breathe. Uh, skip, sneezing is normal in infants because they're trying to clear the nasal passages and infants can identify odors at birth uh, such as breast milk but if we see any nasal flaring uh, in the infants that we may it may be indicative of uh, respiratory distress and it may be one of the first signs we see grunting we may hear grunting and see nasal flaring external retraction, the seesaw breathing, those would all be things that we would need to uh, intervene with. That maybe we need to further assess and put the baby under oxyhood or provide supplemental O2 
for the, the infant if these were occur were to occur. Definitely something that would be need, need to be reported. Put an O2 sat monitor on the baby to make sure the baby's keeping its sats up uh, with all that uh, distressed breathing. We also want to assess the mouth. We're assessing palate, teeth, whether the baby's producing excessive saliva, and anything that might be indicative of infection. Uh, we assess the palate, the soft and the hard palate, uh, for closure, any presence of teeth, what we call milk teeth, which would need to be removed by uh, the pediatrician. We're looking for Epstein's pearls which may be small white cysts resulting from the accumulation of epithelial cells. Those are common. They're usually found around midline of the hard palate, and they'll disappear within a few weeks of birth. But they could be a uh, concern to mom, so you would need to assess if they're there and explain to her when you take the baby out for the first visit what they are and that they're benign and that uh, they'll go away within the first few weeks. You're also looking for the tongue. Uh, with Down uh, infants, we know that they usually have a large protruding tongue with a short frenulum or tied tongue, so they may have problems sucking. Any problems with the mouth is going to make it difficult for babies to, to suckle. So uh, we know that if they have a cleft palate, a protruding tongue, any abnormalities of the mouth uh, would make it difficult for the baby to feed, which would mean the baby would be a poor feeder. and uh, suffer weight loss and not maintain the weight as desired.